groups' efforts to kick off Agile practices within their organizations. Today, we're going to take a look at why there is a shift from more traditional methods of software development to the Agile, to Agile practices. We're going to take a look at how to get off to a really good start from an organizational perspective, and we'll also talk a little bit about what to expect along the way. Before we get started, I'd like to give you a little bit of information about myself. I am a project manager by profession. I have been involved in project management activities for 18 years, primarily around software development, but I've also done some work in marketing and other industry arenas. I have served as a project manager for very, very small projects, all the way up to $50 million programs. So I have a broad range of experience around project management. In about 19, uh, I'm sorry, in about 2004, I was faced with a very, very troubled project that was not going well. It was over budget significantly. It was about two years behind schedule and um, was putting at the entire organization at tremendous risk. And at that time, I started looking at what we could do to put this project back on track very rapidly and help reduce the risk that the organization was facing. And in doing research and looking at the problems we faced, I landed on agile practices as a way to kind of right that project that was going wrong. Went ahead and implemented my first agile practices within that organization, and I have not looked back since then. So what is Agile Software Development? Agile Software Development is um, software development methodologies or frameworks that have a series of sim similar principles. Agile methodologies promote project management processes um, that encourage inspection and adaption a leadership philosophy that encourages teamwork, self-organization and accountability, and then engineering best practices that allow for rapid delivery of high-quality software. And finally, probably the most important thing is that it provides an alignment between development and company and customer goals and needs and delivering value in a very rapid manner. Taking a look at kind of the history of where Agile Software Development got started, um, I'd like to step back for a second into just software development as an industry first. So in the early days of uh, software develop the software development industry, um, we needed to find a method or model to manage our projects or our efforts that would um, satisfy the needs and landed on what is traditionally called predictive or waterfall types of methodologies. And initially, that probably worked extremely well from the perspective of there wasn't a whole lot of change going on. Um, technology was still at that point advancing relatively slowly compared to um, this pace of change today. And businesses and organizations had not fully latched on to the capabilities of software development in terms of enabling their business. In those days, it was probably fine to go through and, and select your projects and run through your full of requirements phase and walk through the normal phases of a waterfall type of project and deliver software at the end. But things started getting a little bit more complex in the late 70s and in the early 80s. Technology changes started accelerating very rapidly. Businesses' approaches to using software to solve business problems grew, and that kind of led to a change in the late 1980s in the software development industry where people began to look for better ways to produce software that would allow them to adapt to and accept the changes that were being faced on a daily basis um, in their environments. This also coincided with some of the lean manufacturing practices that were being introduced in the 80s also, 
And so there was kind of a convergence around lean development um, in software and in uh, manufacturing. So why should we care? The original model was for predictive waterfall um, methodologies involved a series of phases, starting with um, usually planning, moving on to requirements, moving on to design, and then into development, and finally into testing. Each one of those phases was, could be almost a standalone event, starting with um, planning and which produced a set of artifacts coming out of the planning phase, and then you moved into requirements, and there was a set of artifacts that came out of the requirements phase, at which point you locked down and signed off on all of the requirements. Then the team would go into a heavy design phase and create the optimal design to prevent any chance or reduce the risk of um, an incorrect design, and would often spend many, 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 many months producing their design documentation before they could pass it on and move into development. And what development started and when it was finished, it would be finally kind of tossed over the wall back to the customer and would be tested. As I said earlier, in the early days of software development, that was probably okay because there wasn't a significant amount of change or change occurred at a slower rate than it does today. In today's environment, um, customers are not often willing to wait 9 to 12 months before they see the outcome of their software development, and they wanted to take a look at something that would um, be able to address the changes in their needs as they went along the life of the project, something that was more adaptive. On this particular slide, we have two different models um, to take a look at. And in Predictive and Waterfall, which I've covered in detail for software development, it's also tied into the construction industry where you're building kind of track homes, repeating the same model time after time with no variation or very, very limited variations. You know exactly what you're building every single time. On the other side, we have the Sydney Opera House which um, I believe was originally estimated at um, three, I'm trying to remember the stats now, three million dollars and um, four years of, four years of, um, four years to build and ultimately ended up costing a hundred million dollars and taking um, seven to ten years to finish. And in that type of a situation, the Sydney Opera House is a one-off um, is a one-off building. It's not something that would ever be built again. And perhaps a more um, appropriate model would have been to use an adaptive or an iterative approach um, to build the Sydney Opera House. Software development faces some of the same challenges. So for a predictive and a waterfall type of model to work, usually you can absorb about 3% change in requirements or change in design over the course of a project. And with, you're within that 3% change variance, the predictive and waterfall methodology works extremely well. We all know that in today's environment, change is much higher. In fact, oops, the industry average for a project rate of change is 30%. Now, why is that? Usually, um, it involves a new project team, a team that has never worked together before, or some components of a team that has never worked together before. The exact product that you're building has never been built by the team that's been assembled. So although you may be building a accounting system, and you may have worked on an accounting system before in the past, you've never actually built the system that you're building today. It is all new. Um, there are also incomplete statistics on scheduling costs around software development, and because you don't have 
complete statistics. It's often hard to estimate um, the tasks that you'll need to complete to meet all of the projects. The other thing that has happened, as I said before, is that as we've gone through time, um, the need for change within the business environment has expanded very, very rapidly. And between regulatory and competitive advantage and other um, pressures on the business, software teams need to be able to respond to change in a more agile and adaptive way. And so a more appropriate approach for software development is often a new product development model. So if you think about a new product development model, you can think of that from the perspective of maybe, say, a pharmaceutical company, okay? If you go into a pharmaceutical company and the CEO comes to you and says, hey, I'd like you to, you know, build me a project plan and tell me exactly when we're going to develop this um, cure for cancer. And I want you to lay it out in a beautiful project plan with a Gantt chart with all of the um, scheduled tasks planned so that I can announce exactly when we're going to introduce a cure for cancer. Because this is a new product, because you're going to, it's going to involve significant research, you don't really know exactly when you're going to be able to produce that end cure for cancer. And in fact, along the way, you may not actually be able to produce that end cure for cancer as you step through each of the individual phases or iterations of development. There may be other roadblocks that come up or investment opportunities that come up that may change the direction that the business is going in. And by using an adaptive or a new product development type of model, you have the ability to make those changes as you have new information and you know more and are moving forward. Going back to all of the change that gets introduced into a software project, I'd like you to think back to the waterfall methodology where you are involving your customer and your stakeholders very early up front to help you with some of the initial planning but primarily to help you build out those full detailed requirements. And in um, a waterfall environment, you want to nail down in enormous detail the requirements for the software product that you're developing, and then you want to lock those down because you're going to invest heavily in your design phase and in your development phase and if you change those requirements, many times that means you need to go back to the beginning and, and reinvest in planning and in requirements analysis and in design and then also in development. And so introducing change later in the cycle becomes very, very expensive. Um, so from a, project develop, from a project team perspective, you want to tightly control the change that's being introduced. Take a look at for, Take a look at it from the customer's perspective. From the customer's perspective, if you know that you are not going to have an opportunity to ask for any new requirements for the duration of the project, which many times can be 9 to 18 months, you're going to have a tendency to pack or load the boat, which means think of every possible scenario requirement that you could ever possibly need um, including the kitchen sink, and throw that into the mix. And because of that tendency to load the boat, um, you end up with unneeded waste and many times additional scope. So the Standish Group produced a study in 1998 that found that 45% of the features built are never used and 19% are rarely used. So under the waterfall methodology, the end software that is being produced or the product that is being produced has 64% of the features that are included in it that are rarely or never used. That's 64% of your budget, of your time, of your resources that perhaps could have been spent on either enhancements or on other features and other projects. So by creating an opportunity to allow your requirements to emerge over time, 
or packed light um, open up, opens up a lot of opportunity for additional um, features and functionality or, or scope or other opportunities for you to invest that extra money that would have been spent on your 64% of the features that are never, really are never used. So there are a lot of different models that could be used or kind of fall under the adaptive umbrella. And on this particular slide, um, we had showed kind of the contingent, con continuum of predictive methodologies all the way over into adaptive. In the predictive column, you'll see things such as um, CMM, which came out in 1991. There's now CMMI and other um, newer versions of CMM with many of the same principles and practices. Um, in 1969, PMI introduced the PMBOK, which laid out project management best practices and um, provided a set of tools that have been often been used in predictive or waterfall types of projects. And then on the far left-hand side are the adaptive and the agile types of practices or methodologies. Of that list, perhaps the most popular is Scrum, with a very, very significant showing of um, organizations that are adapting Scrum today. Another one that I'll mention in there is extreme programming. Extreme programming, I think, sometimes is given kind of a bad rap because of the um, practices that are introduced in terms of paired programming. But in looking at the practices that are in, introduced in extreme programming, um, extreme programming really focuses on engineering practices. And many of the engineering practices are found to be very, very beneficial in terms of delivering agile projects. Scrum is a project methodology that can be used for software development. Um, it does not contain a lot of the engineering practices that you will find in extreme programming. And so many times you need kind of a combination of the different practices and methodologies to come up with a complete picture of how you can implement an Agile project. So I talked a little bit earlier about the history of how in the mid to late 80s, um, and there were a number of people that started taking a look at more lightweight methods of, of producing software. And in 2001, a group of them got together in Snowbird, Utah, and talked about what those common practices were among Agile software. And they developed the Agile Software Development Manifesto. And this is more a declaration of the values of Agile development. So through this work, we've come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. One thing that is interesting on this is that it doesn't say that we don't value processes and tools. There is value in process and tools, but if you have a choice, it's individuals and interactions that create more value over processes and tools. Processes and tools can absolutely be an accelerator to any Agile team and are absolutely part of successful Agile projects. We also value working software over comprehensive documentation. In a waterfall type of um, software development, it's very focused on artifacts and producing the actual artifacts. So a lot of ceremony is placed around producing a plan. And there is a lot of ceremony around creating a requirement specification and document. And then you move into a design documentation. 
And those tend to be fairly heavyweight types of methodologies, creating comprehensive documentation that many times is never really used outside of the life of the project. On actual teams, we value working software. So this doesn't say that we don't do any documentation. Um, Agile teams do provide documentation as required by the team, by the um, organization, and by the customer. But again, the focus is on working software rather than signed off comprehensive documentation. The next is customer collaboration over contract negotiation. So again, I'm going to go back and talk in the waterfall world for contract negotiation. Your requirements document when it is signed off by the business, signed off in ink, is kind of that contract or the agreement um, that the business is going to hold the team to. In Agile projects, we focus more on collaboration throughout the entire life of the project, just not in the requirements phase. And so you may or you will have a list of in initial features and functionality. And then in working with the customer and understanding their values um, over the life of the project, we'll collaborate with the customer to produce the product that provides the most value to the customer at the end of the day. And then finally, the last point is responding to change rather than following a plan. Within um, Agile projects, there is a point within each iteration where you actually will follow a plan. You sit down and you plan at the beginning of the iteration, and for the course of that iteration, you are locked in to um, the scope and what has been agreed to that will be delivered in that iteration. Agile also, though, allows for responding to change um, outside of that kind of locked-in iteration. And I'd like to say that the locked-in iteration is probably within a time frame of two to six weeks, ideally. So while the team is working their plan for the next iteration, two to six weeks, most of the teams that I'm working with right now are working on two- or three-week iterations. Um, the project is also able to accept change and build in that change before you go into the next planning cycle, which allows a constant shifting and learning in what you're um, producing iteration over iteration. So in the Agile Manifesto, in general, we value the items on the left and agree that there is value, absolutely agree that there is value to the other items that come out of traditional um, practices, such as processes and tools, comprehensive documentation, contract negotiation, and following the plan. Um, but the other items provide more value. So there are a number of principles that stand behind the Agile Manifesto. And these fall into three categories. Um, deliverables and change, people and communication, and feedback. And so under deliverables and change, probably the most important deliverable that we focus on in Agile principles is working software. And that's really our primary measure of progress. Um, other items that are worth noting are continuous attention to technical detail and using good to design to enhance agility. We want to deliver working software frequently in a matter of weeks rather than in a matter of months. Within each iteration, you may decide to release that iteration out to the broader public. But at all times, the goal is at the end of each iteration, you have complete working software um, that is a primary measure, that's the primary measure of progress. People in communication. You want to start with a group of motivated people. 
and you want to build your projects around motivated people. You want to give them an environment and the support they, they need, and you need to trust them to get the job done. In terms of people in communication, one of the major shifts that you'll see from a predictive or waterfall environment in an agile environment is the shift from command and control management into an empowered um, or adaptive type of management situation. So in waterfall, many times the project leaders make all of the decisions, they assign tasks, they decide what the estimates are going to be, and many times will create and build a plan based on their knowledge, um, which may be far, far removed from the actual um, knowledge of the individuals that are working on the, will ultimately be doing the work working on the project. In agile environments, we want to pass as much authority and empower the team to deliver their working software um, as possible. And so this requires a shift in management, types of management control. Um, you will also see that business people and developers have to work together every day throughout the life of the project. And it's very, very important that your business team and, and business members understand the level of commitment that they need to make in order to make Agile work and ultimately give them the products that they need to be able to run their businesses. And then the final thing I want to talk about around um, people in communication is this idea of sustainable development. So many times in a waterfall type of environment, things will run over and the schedule will get pushed. And what often happens instead of the date getting pushed out is the later phases get crunched down. And so maybe we end up in analysis paralysis in the requirements phase, which pushes out the design phase, which then shrinks down the development phase, and then ultimately totally reduces the testing phase to a, a almost meaningless type of exercise just to get the software out the door. In Agile, we want to promote a sustainable development environment where you can maintain a constant pace indefinitely. You don't want to replicate kind of the project death march where everyone is working a million hours for months and months on end. That original troubled project I talked about was on a death march for two years where people were working 70 or 80 hours a week for two years. Um, there was no morale. People at that point just could not even think or process. They were almost on a treadmill, walking forward, not knowing where they were going or what they needed to do. And so in Agile, you really want to try and focus on um, getting to the point where you have a constant pace that is a fairly high pace, but that it can be sustained indefinitely. And then the final principle that I'd like to talk about is feedback. One of the keys is to get regular feedback um, at the end of every single increment or every single interval, and then reflect on that and use that in order to tune their behavior going forward. And many times this feedback is really around behavior more than process, so how the team is behaving so that they can become a high-functioning, high-performing team. So earlier I mentioned that there are many grassroots efforts and organizations across the world right now where development teams have pretty much said, you know, there's got to be a better way and have started adapting agile practices along the way or even gone full board ad with agile um, methodologies. Now you're beginning to see more of a shift so that um, organizations are taking a look at how to um, implement agile practices within their organizations from the top level on down. So it has been fairly success successful from a grassroots effort up. And now you're beginning to see more and more effort around an organizational approach to um, changing from predictive to adaptive. 
So what are the steps that you need to go through to be successful at making the shift into an adaptive or an agile environment? Probably the first and most important one is to find a sponsor, someone who will sponsor the process, will be willing to sponsor some of the pain um, that will be associated with making the change, um, and someone that has patience for the team to the team and the organization to develop. And as high up as you can go to find a sponsor is probably a good thing. And I'd also say that you need sponsors on both sides. You'll need sponsors on the technology side, and you will also need sponsors on the business side who are willing to support this move to an agile or an adaptive methodology. Then it's also good to have a local evangelist, somebody who is excited, has some experience around um, agile practices, who can talk about the benefits on a day-to-day -day basis. And once you have those two kind of key components, the next step would be to assess the organization's readiness for change to agility. So in taking a look at this, you may want to look at the types of projects you're running, the types of software you're developing, the teams that you have working on them, your business environment, your technology environment, um, all kind of go into how ready an organization is to change. When you get ready to start off, I firmly or strongly encourage you to engage a coach. And you may have a coach within your organization to that can take a look at and um, help the team along. In looking for a coach, ideally you're looking for someone that has extensive experience in implementing agile projects both from a project management and process perspective and also from an engineering perspective. What are the engineering practices we need to implement to make this Agile project successful? Other things to look for in engaging your coach is good communication and facilitation skills. Many, many times as you start down the path towards implementing Agile projects, um, your coach is going to act as your change agent for the team, and for the organization. And so having um, that coach kind of run interference and help with the change process is very, very valuable. There will be tough conversations that have to happen at the individual team level and also at the organizational level. And having a coach that is skilled in facilitation to know when to push and when to back down when to ask questions and when to let things run, when to stop a conversation or redirect a conversation, will help all of that go much smoother. So once you have a coach engaged, um, you want to select an initial project or a series of projects. And my recommendation is to start small. You don't probably want to introduce Agile across the entire organization at one time. My recommendation is that you go um, with a little bite first, and by a little bite, I don't mean implement, partially implement Agile. I'm talking about take a small team or small product that you want to work on as your kind of pilot or sample case. And the goal of this pilot project is to show positive benefits to the organization, okay? So how can this type of process methodology help our organization and benefit our organization in the long run? You want to create a short, prioritized list of features to support that project or projects. Um, does not need to be very, very extensive. It will grow over the course of the, the pilot program. And then you want to provide training. And training will come in a number of different um, forms. You want to have process and methodology training for the team for business owners and for stakeholders. You also want to introduce engineering practices to the team. Now, sometimes teams are already using those engineering practices and you won't need to provide um, this type of training. But many times, um, engineering practices are best practices which are not being used currently by development teams. And so there is a learning curve associated with some of those new engineering practices that you'll want to implement. 
Then you take your initial set of projects and features that you want to deliver, and you'll want to execute three to six iterations. Your iterations will be decided team by team, project by project, depending on a number of different factors, such as how rapidly you need to produce software and get something out the door. Um, also, how much risk is there associated with it? If you have projects that are high risk or high change, you may want to go with shorter iterations. And in projects that are maybe don't have the same level of risks or the same level of change requirements, then you perhaps go into longer iterations. As I said earlier, the standard is probably between two and six weeks with most of the projects that I see happening now tending towards four weeks or less. With every iteration, you will want to plan. At the end of the iteration, you'll inspect, and inspect includes feedback and a demonstration to your customer or to the owner of the product. And then you'll adapt and then move on to the next iteration. And so you're constantly learning and taking action on your learnings with every single iteration. It's not a situation where you get to the end of the project and the final thing you do is your lessons learned or post-mortem, which then becomes a beautiful piece or artifact of shelfware that may be used by another team in the future, but in all reality, probably is just uh, lessons documented. In Agile teams, you take action on those lessons that you're learning every single iteration. And then once you get through your initial three to six iterations and your teams are beginning to function as high-performing teams and you're beginning to see the benefits, you can start to expand the Agile footprint. To do that, you'll again want to provide more training, brown bags, forums. Um, it may want to be ask the experts. Lots of different forms as you begin to roll this out into the organization. You'll expand projects and teams. And again, I would pick another set of projects and teams to expand this to. And then set them on a course for their initial three to six iterations. Measure and adapt, measure, review, and adapt again. And continue to expand out your Agile footprint until you have as much of your organization covered as needed. So what does it feel like and how, what to expect as the organization becomes Agile? The first thing I want to mention is change is hard. Anything, anytime you are introducing change within an organization, it is hard. So why is it hard? The Agile processes and methodologies are relatively simple. So what makes the change hard? Some of it is that um, we have ingrained in us and have worked for many, many years in one method or model, and it becomes very easy and comfortable to work in that environment. Facing the new the new Agile type of practices requires a change from command and control to empowered, where teams have to actively and proactively make decisions and think for themselves rather than allowing their managers to make the decisions. As much as they ask for that, that is a hard lesson for teams to learn. Um, they are used to plan and artifact-driven development rather than software-driven development. So many times what I'll see in new teams being implemented is the developers, you know, sitting there saying, well, I can't move until I have all my requirements defined. And the tester saying, I can't develop until I have all the requirements and I have all of the design and I have all of the development done. Those types of practices of waiting for each of those individual artifacts are carryovers from the old way, and teams have to learn how to operate differently and become cross-functional, and that takes time. They also need to, have to learn how to work in parallel all at the same time. Your requirements analysts or your business analysts will be doing work and on a day-to-day -day basis and working with your developers and working with your testers all at one time in a very, very rapid cycle. And so teams many times will sit and wait for the end artifact, and that's just not going to happen anymore. 
There's also a fear of the unknown, fear of taking risks. And um, finally, it's not you can't develop a series of checklists, procedures, and forums for an agile environment. Each team needs to figure out how they are going to operate and what are their um, standards and definitions of done. And so it's not something that can be created and checked off. It is something that has to emerge team by team. Um, the next one is agile processes, practices expose organizational flaws. So these could be cultural rules that are in existence within your organization that cause problems. Um, an example is I worked with one organization that had about 200 total technology technologists within their organization that included everything from um, help desk all the way through to the CIO it was about 200 and they had a cultural rule that said that you had to have 45 signatures before you could move anything from your development environment to your integration environment think about it almost 25 percent of the, their IT organization had to sign off before any piece of code could move and that was coming from a couple of different things. The first thing was that there was a culture of fear in the organization that if you didn't sign off and have, if you, that if you did sign off, you would be the single ring, ring of the neck and that if a project failed or if something went bad in any of the environments, that you'd be fired. And so no one was willing to take the risk of being fired because a uh, uh, release went badly. But there was another issue that was going on that was even odder, and that was that this was an organization that had, oddly enough, 45 people at vice president or above levels. And it was a very hierarchical organization, and pretty much it was a, an entitlement that if you were a vice president, you got to sign off and nothing could go into production unless you said so. And so it was these two organizational flaws that the team had to work through and manage as, as they tried to move into an agile type of practice. Agile practices also encourage transparency and truthfulness. Um, many times we are not used to being truthful about our projects and our project status. You will many times be on schedule, on time, up to the day that you're supposed to deliver when at that point you announce, well, maybe you're a month behind or maybe two months behind. So in agile practices, you talk about what's not working and what blocks you have and impediments very, very rapidly. And because there's truthfulness around that, many times it feels like everything is broken and um, can create kind of a sense with our management that, oh, my gosh, we're airing dirty laundry and nobody should know about this. But for agile practices to work, you have to understand what the blocks and impediments facing the team are, and that's done through transparency and truthfulness so that you can address them and remove them. Your willingness to change will be challenged daily. Again, that goes back to it's easier to go back to doing things that, as you've always done them and fall into patterns and practices that you're comfortable with rather than challenging to change and do things differently on a daily basis. You can also expect impediments in the, process, in the arenas of process impediments, so people not showing up to meetings on time, um, or um, your facilitator or leader's management will dictate what the teams are doing. Also, maybe your teams are too large, or something like adding scope after your iteration begins. You'll face people practices also, um, these can be people practices by team or by organization, so people or teams are not fully dedicated, they're not co-located, teams are interrupted by other work, um, teams and individuals prefer email versus face-to-face -face communication, and sometimes there's a the passive culture where you wait and sit and wait until you're told to do something or you sit and wait until you receive that next artifact, and so those create impediments. In engineering practices, those can include things like um, not forcing system iteration with or system integration with every iteration, um, not fully implementing or testing each increment for each iteration, not creating cross-functional resources. 
So cross-functional resources mean that your analysts, your developers, your QA need to operate as one cohesive unit and need to be able to expand beyond their core practice to get whatever needs to be done on a particular day done. And finally, organizational practices that can create impediments are rewarding individuals over the team. This becomes, Agile becomes a very team-centric type of operation. Many times you'll have QA and tests separate and not integrated in with your um, development team. In order for Agile to work, those teams need to be absolutely integrated. Your business analysis, your development, and your QA tests need to absolutely be integrated in with the team and, and support the team. Um, also, you'll face issues with teams not having sufficient authority to make small organizational or space decisions to affect their job. Teams need to be empowered. Agile also changes more than just the development environment or department. So it may start with the development department, but in order for it to be successful, it requires a high investment and involvement by your business, business analysts, and also your business owners to provide guidance and direction, vision for what the team is producing. Um, and many times this business involvement becomes one of the largest impediments that you need to overcome. Business users are not used to being asked what they want other than during the requirements phase up front. They're being used to being shown something that they didn't want usually when the product is being produced or at the end when it's being delivered. And so shifting them from a mindset of I'm going to participate up front and then at the end um, to a mindset of they need to be involved on a daily basis requires significant change. Agile benefits are also not immediate. Um, if you think about a traditional project, you may go six to nine months to produce that initial piece of feedback on how the project is doing. Is it doing well? Is it not doing well? Within Agile, you can usually do that within three to six iterations, which could be as short as you know, three or four months, but it does take time for the benefits to be recognized. It's not immediate, and many teams will struggle initially in the first couple iterations, finding their pace, figuring out what to do, and how to make the process work. Agile is not a silver bullet. There may be projects where Agile is not appropriate. There are possibly even organizations where Agile is not appropriate and full scale. And so you need to assess your organization's readiness to change in determining whether Agile is the right answer or not. Also, a group of bad developers that have bad practices are not going to become super developers just because Agile is introduced. Bad developers will still fail in Agile the same way that they fail in other projects. And finally, um, in terms of change is hard, and I know I've said that twice, it's very important that you adopt the mindset and that you don't mess with the process. Once you go down the path of implementing an Agile process, you want to make sure that you follow that process until you become really good at the process. Half Agile is very dangerous. And um, many times process-oriented managers will have a hard time adjusting to the different philosophies and cause friction which makes it easier to fall into that half agile, we're agile, but we're really not type of, a, type of an environment. And you need to fight against that. So that concludes my presentation today. As we've gone through this, we've talked a little bit about why there's a shift to agile development. Um, we've also talked a little bit about how to get off to a good start and what to expect along the way. And at this point, I'd like to turn it back over to Katie. Great. Katie, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. We did have a few questions come through, and I know we're getting close to the hour mark, but um, I'm going to go ahead. And the first one, first question is, are there any projects you would not recommend going Agile? 
Yeah, I, I think that there are probably projects that are appropriate to run in predictable or waterfall types of methodologies or maybe even other methodologies outside of Agile. Those types of projects usually consist of um, projects that are very, very well known, the product is well known, where you know that there's going to be very, very limited change throughout the life of the project. If you know that going into a project you're going to have less than 3% change introduced over the course of the project, the waterfall predictive methodology works extremely well, and there's no, no reason why you cannot follow that. Also, where you have high reliability, so um, examples that are usually given are um, space missions or um, aerospace types of projects, you may um, need additional controls and balance that can be provided by Agile projects, but you may want to have redundant types of controls. And some of those are better managed through um, a more predictive type of methodology. Great. Next question. How do you engage the business when they are so busy? <laughs> one day at a time. You engage the business one day at a time. Again, I think you have to go back to that initial business sponsor and um, make the case for how this adds value. Initially, this is usually only a problem getting them involved in the first iteration or two. Once they see how their input impacts the team and the, how their influence and their involvement moves the team forward more rapidly, they can start to get excited also, and it becomes much easier for them to be involved in a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Initially, many times you just have to schedule the time and, and make sure that at the highest levels you have the commitment from the business leaders to invest in that time to give them the end product that they want. Okay, great. Well, if there are no further questions at this time, I know we're, we're right at the hour mark. Um, we would like to thank you so much, Edie, for today's presentation. Um, we will be forwarding out both the slide deck and the recorded version of this presentation as soon as it becomes available in about a week's time. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions about this presentation or Nudesic in general, please feel free to email myself. Um, my email address is on this ending slide. And again, thank you everyone so much for joining, and we look forward to seeing you on our next Nudesic webcast. Thank you. <laughs>